This interview is being done for the Oral History Library of the Fashion Institute of Technology. The interview is with John Pomerantz, son of Fred Pomerantz of Leslie Fay Incorporated. The date of the interview is November 11, 1981. The interviewer is Mildred Finger. Um, John, could we just begin back a little bit and tell me when you first got into this business and what you did when you were in it? I started in 1955. I graduated from Wharton School. I went to live in wilkes -Barre, Pennsylvania. I lived in a factory. We had an apartment in a factory. I lived there for about a year doing all sorts of jobs. I went through every type of job and um, ended up being the assistant to the president. To the general manager, I guess he was then. Was that Zachary? Zach Buckwalter, yeah. Uh, then I was called in when a peace goods buyer in New York had a heart attack and died, and I came in and bought peace goods for a little while. Then I started working at Leslie Fay as a trainee for Irving Sherendorf, who was my father's first, I think, employee, oldest employee. He's been here about 50 years now, 45 years. I uh, worked there for a while, I don't remember how long, got into sales, and then um, at 21, let's see, 21 years ago, so that would be 1960, I, I guess in 1959 I opened up Joan Leslie. Uh, I went off 1960, we moved over to 7th Avenue to 537th Avenue on the fourth floor. 1961, I believe, or 62, we got Casper to join join us, and I ran Joan Leslie until 1971. You were president of the President the of Joan of Leslie. Division. We opened up JL Sport, and I became executive vice president of Leslie Fay, I guess, in 19... Uh, maybe 1968. I don't know the dates, but... By then you yeah. had been, you had already gone public, right? You were on the... We exchange. went public for five years, but no one, no one knew who I was in Wall Street. And I was really an executive vice president. I had the title, but I didn't have the, uh, the game. And about ten years ago, this coming December, uh, Zach died. 1972, that was. Yeah. Or the end of 71. So I yeah. So this will be my 10th anniversary, and I became president in December. President of, of Leslie, Leslie Fay, Inc., yeah. which is the total company. Right. And I guess we're doing about $85 million or something like that, mostly in dresses. Just that one thing, we have one sportswear company. When time. did you begin to diversify? I guess we just started to diversify in 1972. I haven't got a timetable because, you know, how we did all this, but we really started getting into sports in a major way. Well, in 1962, when you went public, it was just Leslie Fay Inc. Right. right? The we, one I think we did $16 million or something mm -hmm. like that. It was right. I think it was Leslie Fay, uh, Brian Brook Suits at the time, and uh, Leslie Palmer might have been with us then, half sizes. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what it was. I guess some reach, reach, I, don't, I don't have the figures, but I know that's what it, I think it was. Uh, we we just started branching out into other into other areas. Acquisition or or by internal opening of divisions. Both, mostly internal. We acquired personal sportswear. You know, I don't know the date of that, but I guess that's historical. And um, that was before I became president. It was doing, I think, eight million dollars, and started to do poorly. So we tried to uh, even we tried not to keep it. We tried to sell it back to the founder. And uh, th through a combination of events, which involved using the double knits from our knitting mill at the time, changes of management, and bringing Alan Golub, who was the son of the founder, into a more prominent position, we started to really grow it personal. And from personal, we branched out into Breckenridge Sportswear, which has become a major factor. And then we had JL Sport we had opened up. We opened up um, 
face closet a couple of years ago. We bought Outlander about uh, five years ago. We bought a company called Nativo about five or six years ago. Those are two sweater companies. Uh, from Breckenridge, we opened up a company called Victoire, which, which is sportswear. So today, we probably have more sportswear companies than we have dress companies. We do have more sportswear companies than dress companies. And we have, um, but I, th I still think we do more dress business than we did night before when we went public, or when I became president. So even though we've grown our sportswear tremendously, we still do more business and dresses than we did 10 years ago, but with much fewer companies. What do you think were some of the, are some of the differences in techniques that you're using today uh, as against the techniques of uh, 10 years ago? Well, we've obviously become more, um, uh, not automated, but more dependent on a, on, on, on data. We've learned to use data better, more efficiently. We've become very efficient in, in our collection area. Um, I think what, what we've tried to do collection, collection is is working with the stores to get paid. Oh, and what right. We've, yeah. I, I guess what we've tried to do, and when we are successful, this is the making of a successful company, to use modern information, and yet use it in a way that the certain talent that that individual has, um, the the individuality of 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 his of what makes him tick can still be used. It can't be a strictly an automated business. It's got to be a business with a heart, and um, you can't take that away, but you could give that man more information. When you Basi say that man, you're talking about the heads of the The heads of the companies, companies yeah. Uh, basically, the other thing is we've gotten big. We've gotten respected. We always were respected, I can tell you that. But uh, a new generation of retailers has grown up, and I guess the important part is that they've kept that respect. I was thinking about the other day because if we go private, uh, my father's been in business for 60 years, and there's a possibility that this company could become a hundred-year-old company in a, you know, in a, in a field that really is not prone for that kind of a business. It's there's a, there's a saying in a, in, a, in our business: you should close every seven years. Oh, really? Yeah. Because okay, it's yeah. hard to keep doing business, and the overhead goes up, and you can't keep making the money, but. Uh, it's a great industry. There's a chance for someone to come in with no money and do it, but it's also an industry today that's starting to recognize bigness. And um, I guess the strengths that we have, we've been able to attract people. Uh, we've been able to surround them with the proper information and the pro proper balance that gives them the opportunity to make money for us and for themselves. Um, what are some of what are some of your what is some of your philosophy about advertising? Because I noticed that in French Vogue uh, some years ago there were ads uh, by American companies, including Joan Leslie and Leslie Fell. My philosophy about advertising is uh, you can never do too much of it, but it's got to be proper advertising. It's got to it's got to work. Um, arm and arm with the marketing part of the business. And I don't think it's enough to just to just um, m make an image, even though I think that's important. But in some of our companies, we're in the moderate to better field, and with the exception of Casper, we're not in the designer field. So we have to try to make an image for that company, but we've got to sell a lot of merchandise off it, too, because our business is to grow. I think advertising helps you grow. I think some of our divisions don't use it right, and I'm trying to get them to, but it's an individual kind of thing. Basically, in a company our size, where you are hiring people and giving people the responsibility of running their companies and spending the money, and unless you want to sit there and make every decision for them, you can't just make some decisions. You have to let them make a all. Sometimes they're good and sometimes they're not, and uh, I encourage one of the things I try to encourage is, is advertising techniques, because I believe it. Um, each of the companies is run individually, mm -hmm. and some of the companies vary from each other in terms of basic policies. 
some of the companies can vary as far as basic policies, yes. I haven't set a complete corporate policy in everything we do because um, I'd be restricting them. And I think that's been some of the some of the problems that have happened in this industry is when companies larger who are not used to being a power company try to set guidelines that are not based on our business. Basically, we have 15 companies that come to market five times a year. So that's 75 markets. You mean they make 75 collections a yeah, year? Yeah, five them. collections a year, 15. So that's 75 collections, each of them averaging 60 garments. So basically I'm coming out with anywhere from five, four, 45 to 5,500 items. And it's, it's just something that can't be um, completely legislated. So, um, each, each firm has its own showroom? Each firm has its own showroom. A lot of companies don't do it that way. Yeah, that's why I'm interested yeah, in it. It's very much, this that. is more expensive. But I believe that uh, if one guy tries, one man tries to do too much, he's going to end up ruining the both companies. So we try to have each company with its own firm, its own salespeople. We don't like to have them share. Uh, we like the company to stand on its own. Oh, separate designers? Separate design staff. Uh, separate production staff and separate sales staff. So that what holds it all together are where, where you are a corporation is that where you collect information. I assume that that's a centrally mm -hmm. operated function. Central, op central operating functions. We do share shipping quarters. We, um, we supply the, all the accounting and all the financial and all the data processing, all the legal work. Um, Basically, that's what the corporation does. The corporation is very thin. It really consists of, uh, of myself and an executive vice president and a senior vice president who's an operational guy and uh, my father. And Walter Leiner, who's the executive vice president, is head of all our financial arms. And that's a big job. Uh, Alan Gallup has senior vice president of Leslie Faye, Leslie Faye Sportswear Group, and he's got four or five companies reporting to him. Um, we just made Norman Feinberg, who you may or may not know, head of the sweater divisions, which is just two divisions, Nativo and Outlander. And they'll be, they'll, he was running Nativo, so they'll both report to him. And then a few and of the, the companies report to me. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the manufacturing arms, it's it's... It's not a tightly structured organization uh, with a consistent chain of command. And um, obviously I float in and out of all the companies and, and there doesn't seem to be any um, feeling of uncomfortableness with that. Um, you float in and out of all the companies. Um, that means that you have, do you have, do you have formal meetings with the heads of the companies? Yes. We, what we do, the way we gather our information is we get daily sales information and daily shipping information. We have um, uh, weekly sales and weekly, ship, weekly shipping, monthly uh, financials that we uh, discuss with the division heads, but they discuss with their people, quarterly financials that we have a meeting with each one from corporate you know, and the division heads, and a very formal six-month um, Plan. At which point you plan for the following we plan six for months? This, well, we plan, no, that six months is probably in. We might plan for the following six months after that. Uh, but we really go over, six months, we really go over the, the figures much with a much stronger um, feeling of what it is because we feel that's a longer period. One month, it's very difficult in our industry because shipments could shipments can fall on the first of the next month instead of the 30th of this month and change the whole pattern. But we feel six months really gives you a pattern of, of history. And we compare it against budget and we compare it against the actual of last year. We have a, um, a long-term plan, but our long-term plan is not, um, it's not that long. We t it's not five years. No. no. We can't plan it in five years. We know we'd like to be maybe, but we don't know how we're going to get there. But we know how we, we know where we'll be. Uh, we know where we're going to be this year. We know where we'll be next year. But 
but we know what we should be next year. We don't always make our plans. Well, now with something like the acquisition of Head, mm -hmm. um, which is an acquisition, not something which has grown up out of the. Out it's of a the major. Thing. It's a major acquisition. Right. Um, that is that 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 would be, I assume, something. I shouldn't assume, but was that planned well in advance of the actual happening? That's been six months in the works, and uh, very tough negotiations with AMF, but very, you know, fair. Um, that's the biggest thing we've ever tried to take on. Mm -hmm. We felt that they needed an apparel feeling about that. They were being run as a, AM, a AMF was, was um, more strict, and what we're going to try to do is just take the reins off and look at their products, try to get them into products they're not into, try to go over there, you know, who their people are and, and their methods right. of distribution. But that was something that um, I can't tell you we plan to buy head, but we, the, the long term, the short term plan was to get into the active, active sportswear business. So that's really how it started. Uh, and we decided. approached head with it. We approached AMF rather than they didn't approach us. Mm -hmm. Is Alex just still there? No, he's resigned. He's resigned. Mm -hmm. So that um, he, I'm, I'm, he resigned I'm, the first day we we took it over. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to work for us. So you will be putting somebody else in. Well, they have a president of America and they have a president of Germany, and we don't know what we're going to do yet. We're going to just look at it and make the people comfortable and um, see what it is. There was no sense examining it until we owned it seems that they were meeting with Alex Schuster at the same time they were meeting with us, and he was hurt and disappointed he didn't want to work for us. So you know, if someone doesn't want to work for Leslie Fay, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't have to. But we'll make another Alex We'll make someone better, hopefully. I'm sure. I'm sure. Tell me something about uh, going private at this point, because it does make you uh, one of the first. Well, it's a very interesting situation here. We have an 81-year-old chairman who has 20, with his, with his family, excluding me, he has about 25% of the company. Um, these, we think and always have felt that this is the best apparel company. I think we've exhibited, we've never lost money. Even when we closed our knitting mill, we made, um, we made money. And, um, when did you close that knitting mill? Two years ago. You decided that there was no point in having that sort of operation? It was the wrong thing. It was, it was tragic, but it was the wrong thing. But I guess the lesson that teaches you is that this business has a lot of changes, and uh, the successful people are the ones that change. Uh, companies that have such a big capital expense get hurt when something like that happens. And, I guess it's made me a little wary of, of really putting a lot of capital into one area now. But meanwhile, we made the money. We became. We were still profitable. We closed it. Uh, five years ago, I guess it was. We closed the men's. Our men's. The men's part of our industry. The our men's part of the industry, and we. That was John. Uh, John Palmer. John. We, that was a major thing to close to, but we felt that we weren't going to be successful in it. And we made money that year. We just didn't make as much to, as the year before. And uh, we think that we're a company that's a little bit above everybody else's, but we haven't been able to tell Wall Street that. No, we've been able to tell them, but they haven't been able to listen for some reason. And it just was a company that, no matter what we did, we're doing, we're going to make a lot of money this year. Our, the price of our stock wouldn't rise. And I was concerned. Uh, the original plan made it. We were ho talking a little about uh, maybe retiring my father's stock, but then that would have left us with a with a chance for, for someone who's unfriendly to pick up the company. And I think that this company really is a company of people who who want to work for the same people they've been working for. And um, this gave us an opportunity for my family and the stockholders to get what I think is a very good price at today's market. And it gave us, it gave management a chance to come back and run the company, which I think everybody wants. You know? I think the retail community wants it, and I think that uh, certainly the people that work for us want it.
So that you feel that the adva there are advantages to being private, that you don't have to report to all kinds of extraneous... Uh, well, that's time-consuming, and it's it, it might not be as... Um, it's certainly not important to an apparel company to do all the things they have to do to become public, but you just let people do it. I don't, I don't really feel that that, that was a... Um, certainly wasn't a detriment. I, if anything, I think it helped us grow and be in public. Well, for, uh, financially, I should assume it would have helped. It did help. That is to say, there was... Yeah, you know, we had the money to grow. Mm -hmm. Right. But uh, this way, uh, I don't know. Everybody's told me that this seems to be the best of everything. The stockholders are happy. My family, I guess, is fairly happy. I think that they are uh, concerned that my father's not going to be involved. And I have a chance to um, stay with the company and run it, which I think I'd like to do, obviously. And um, right now it's the best of all possible worlds. Is we there going to be a third generation, do you think? Uh, I only have daughters. I don't. When my oldest is 17, I don't know if she wants to come into the business. Um, I do have a nephew who's in the business and who's 29 or 30 now. My sister's boy, uh -huh, right. Andrew Gross, and right. who's probably the smartest man in the whole company already. And he's running uh, a small new company we just built, Personal Petite, Petite Sportswear. And as he grows, I would hope he would uh, have the opportunity. It's not going to be handed to him. But I don't, it, it wasn't really handed to me either. Yes, I'd like to know. That's mm. a, a major uh, interest that I have in, in, uh, in this whole discussion. Um, what was your, I mean, how did you feel about all of this when you were growing up? And, and I always wanted to do it. Uh, it was something that was in my blood. I guess what happened with me is that uh, my father and I just, in business at least, uh, we didn't see eye to eye on anything. And I had to try to do it on my own. I had to go away from him and try to at least show someone that I could make it on my own. Is this why you went to Wilkes-Barre? No, no, this was why no. I opened up Joan Leslie. Oh, um, I see. Yeah. I remember graduating college with a degree from Wharton, which is not an unimportant thing. and. I said to him, now I want you to teach me the dress business. And he said, I don't teach you, learn. And I guess you don't really teach in this business. You'll, you got to learn it. I had a lot of tough times. Like what? Well, like, uh, we almost closed Joan Leslie the second year I was in business. Um, like not talking to my father for a year or two. Um, really doing on my own, building up my own, my own career. I didn't get any help. But that's the way it should be when I look back at it. Yeah, uh, this appears, this yeah. is really a business of entrepreneurs, isn't yeah. it? I mean, it really... Yeah, it can't, it's not handed to you, you gotta go out and get it. Uh, some of the people in my generation are doing a nice job now. I'm happy for them. But I think today we're respected, and I think I've earned the respect. And, you know, I would hope my father understands that, but he finds himself in competition sometimes. He doesn't even know we have, I mean, he does know, obviously, that we have the comes, but he's all, like you say, he really is interested in Leslie Fay. Yes. He's and very Leslie proud Fay is having the best year they ever had. Extremely proud of you. Yeah. Um, the, uh, and Leslie Fay is having a big year. Yeah. Let me tell you how I, how I view the industry. I think what he did uh, was incredible. I can never think of doing it, because this, the history of our industry is it's not always a pretty history, and it needed tough people, strong people, and he didn't have education, and he did it, and he turned it over to me, and I, uh, he didn't turn, he turned it over to someone else who, who, who I inherited the job from. Um, You're talking about uh, 1972 as that yeah, yeah, I don't think that, uh, I think I was the right person in 1972 to run this company. I have brought it to where I'm going to bring it to, and then the next guy that's going to come over and I'm going to let run, run it, I'm going to look at him like he, everything he's doing is wrong. But I guess that's the way it is, because the, the sophistication is so different today. Then. You still need, you still need that talent. Uh, 
that entrepreneurial talent, that design talent, whatever you want to call it, but it's only really great when that talent blends with the sophistication, and that happens once in a while. It's nice to see when it happens. We, we, we're just a company of people, uh, maybe not the best people in every spot. Uh, I don't know if, you know, I don't know if, if I've I've, I try to attract very good people, pay well, they make a lot of money here. Uh, I've never felt that I had to be the highest paid earner in Leslie Fay. Have but you got a policy of bringing them up through the ranks, or do you do a lot of hiring we from do outside? Both. We do both. both. Yeah. And I think we've learned a lot from the outside people, but also the outside people learned a lot from us. Um, but I think on a whole we've attracted better people in other big companies, and I think that we're a combination of uh, talent, and, and we still we still care. I think that's nice. Yeah. I don't think some of the stores we sell care today. I, I don't think that we've developed into that hard-nosed um, uh, business at any cost kind of a thing that some of the people we're doing business with have today. But I guess we're getting there. Um, tell me something about the policy of selling one store in a city, for example. Do you do that in some of the divisions, in all of the divisions, or in none of the divisions? We police who we sell, but I don't think we can find. Uh, if a city's small and we don't feel we could get it, you know, we feel it would be not self-serving to to sell more than one account. We'll, we'll only sell one. If the population is such that we feel we could do good with, we could do well just selling two accounts, we'll sell two accounts. So, But when you talk about big cities, we really don't confine. We might have one or two confinements, but I, I don't know about it. But we try to go after the best stores, and we try to make sure that they, um, you know, we don't have break dates and things like that, but what we try to do is sell them enough so we don't have to plaster our goods all over the city because I don't think that's a good idea. What happens if you acquire a company that has had policies different from your own? For instance, when you acquired R&K. No, we didn't acquire R&K. It was Logan, but... Oh, I'm... Yeah, yeah, I just took yeah. that out of the tape. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, but there were, um, one of the things that was a bit unclear in my head after I, when I talked to your father mm -hmm. is this whole thing of one exclusivity, which was apparently a selling device. At the beginning, that's why he opened right. Leslie Fay. Right. Yeah. Well, and that was because Leslie Fay was a grand, was a child of his company called Palmet. Right. And to differentiate, he tried to do it that way. But then he found that it w he wasn't sophisticated to check on it. And uh, the stores weren't growing enough, so that's what he's. And they would, you know, he like he said, he's. I'm not the businessman, even though he was a great businessman and a great seller. He wasn't the record keeper that could see if the company was doing a hundred thousand or a hundred and ten thousand or ninety thousand. And uh, he just, he he started it that way, but that's definitely what he doesn't. He doesn't care for that, and we don't do that. What about? this business of requiring that stores buy a certain number of stocks. That was a policy for a long time. Is it still a policy or is it a policy in It's flux? a policy in, uh, in certain companies, not in all companies. Not in all companies within the firm, right. but in some of them. Yeah, it's a policy in Lazy Fay and LF Petit, those two companies. Some of the other companies might have a policy of a minimum order. Mm -hmm. uh, Um, could we talk some about your childhood and what it was like to grow up in the family of a, a man who is as dedicated and as individualistic a person as your father? I don't remember having a childhood. Um, when I you also had a mother and a sister. Well, what they did with me, uh, and it probably turned out to be a good thing, but my sixth grade, after fifth grade, I went away to school. I went to a military academy. And so I was in military academy for sixth, seventh, and eighth grades. And uh, I graduated grammar school, you know, lower school, and then I went to um, high school, graduated high school. 
So my childhood was really spent in a military academy um, environment. Uh, I was a little thing. I was so skinny and little. And um, I, I was at a school that didn't have that many. <coughs> I was a Jewish boy growing up in a, in a school that uh, that didn't have many Jewish people and very few. And I had to learn that. That was tough. Uh, we had boats. We had beautiful. Uh, my father, at those days, had beautiful yachts. And I guess I was going to try to get to Annapolis, but I couldn't get in because of my I wore glasses then. And um, so you went to college where? I went to University of Pennsylvania. Oh, and then to Wharton. Yeah, yeah, Wharton. right. Well, Wharton was University of Pennsylvania. I didn't go to business school. I, mean, I didn't go to graduate school. I took my business uh, as an undergraduate. I see, I see. Okay. Um, he was a giant, my father. In those days, I guess, his he was the best, you know. And uh, he loved it. And um, I guess to his love for it, I wanted it, you know. I never knew it would be it was just... You know, I remember we were close, and then somehow we weren't close, and um, it was a... Um, my father's a very strange man in a, in a way that he's he doesn't want to show that he's got softness in him, but he's probably a, a very soft guy, and, and I'm a very soft guy, and we're very stubborn. Must have inherited, I guess I inherited a lot of what he's got, you know, and... Um, I don't remember fighting with people when I grew up. I remember being fighting sometimes because someone, you know, didn't like me being Jewish. But I don't remember. I think I had a lot of friends. I don't have memories about uh, memories. It's funny. It's one of the things I I don't have recall about a lot of things. You don't remember, for example, when you came home from school for holidays. I used to hitchhike um, every Saturday and every Sunday morning. I used to leave school about five o'clock and hitchhike into New York and have. Um, lunch with my father at, uh, and my mother, well, at least my mother, I don't remember if my father was there. He was a big gambler in those days. Uh, and the business, I guess, is, it, he was terrific on the pressure. So maybe the gambling made him better in his own business, but uh, I don't remember too much about, I remember going to Palm Beach a lot. We used to uh, go down there every Christmas, and I loved it. What was your relationship I, I, with your I sister? Love my, I love being a... Uh, my sister and I are, are not close, but I guess we love each other, and we're just not close. Cause, was she in uh, the business one time? She worked at one time, yeah. Now she's just... Uh, she gets a... Um, you know, we pay for her name, but that's that's what she does now. She's working and very active and... Uh, in charity, blind, special work with the blind. And she's the vice president of her building, and uh, where she lives. And which my work sister and I. Which uh, work with the which uh, blind organization? Because my husband's president of the Jewish Guild for the Blind. And I just. She, she works for them. Really? What's her name? Uh, Leslie Palmer. I will ask her. Yeah. He's probably her boss. I, mean, I don't know how. No, more. he's the president. He's a lawyer. He yeah, doesn't work. Yeah. I know, with, yeah. 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 Um, well, she just, she's cuffed. I don't know why she does that, but she obviously well, loves it not? and does sure, it. Yeah, sure. Just like your husband does. Um, well, I don't know how personal I want to get into a thing like this, mm -hmm. but... But anyway, so, well, you, all right, so you have your sister, and your sister has a son... Yeah. ...who is 29 and who is in this business. Yeah, and who's could have a great career with, a, with Leslie Faye or any place else. And because you think he's very good. Yeah. No, it's, it's going to be interesting to see. And I'm treating him, not ne not necessarily treating him, but I'm treating him, uh, I guess, the way I was treated. But I, that's not the way I want to treat him. And he can come to me and talk to me. But I'm letting him do his own thing. He's going to Columbia uh, Business School while he's running a company. And I think it's great that he can get that kind of uh, education and still learn how to run a company. That's not a big one. But he could do uh, maybe five and a half million dollars his first year in business. 
and, and the principles of, of a small company yeah. and of a bigger company. It's good to learn. It's like uh, stores might start you off in a small department, and so that's what he's doing. Uh, he's impatient, and he's he's got 10 more years or 15 more years of, of brains than we do, and he's probably going to look at us and think everything we're doing is is archaic, but you know, and I think we're a fairly modern company. But Andy is a very bright guy. He, he really wants to go into the marketing part of it. And I think what's happening is that we're. I'm back sorry, what's his last name? Gross. Andy Gross. Gross. Right, okay. I think what's happening is we're starting to go from selling to marketing. That's the next, the next part of our industry. And. Um, what, 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 how are you defining marketing? I define marketing um, as, as creating a plan from both from research and from product to go out and present um, more than the product to the customer, to present an idea of how to sell the product, to try to reach the ultimate customer, which uh, Gloria Vanderbilt did for a while. You know, they sold it against the stores, uh, didn't work because they didn't have the product. But uh, so marketing to me means the ability to create a product and to try to find out how to um, bring that product to the marketplace in, in a way other than the traditional way which we've done throughout the years, which is knowing the stores and selling it through the stores. We're going to continue to sell through the stores, but we're probably going to try to um, combine the advertising and the promotion in such a way that uh, there's a reason to buy our merchandise and something less as opposed to someone else's. I, th I think that marketing is done in the um, cosmetic field. You're we, talking, we are you talking about identifying uh, or identifying yourselves in the eyes of the private, of the consumer as well as in the yeah. eyes of the store? Yeah, for integrity and, and to have a plan on how to sell, sell through and um, it's more than just holding up a garment today. It's knowing who the customer is. It's knowing who you want to, yeah, it's yeah. trying to target for your ultimate consumer and then try to um, try to reach her through the customary lines of communication, which, which is through a store. How important a role has the advertising agency come to me in your life, ha have in your life? Well, you know, it's uh, we're. Doing I don't even know if you deal with an agency. We deal with AC and R, and we're doing things in Leslie Fay that are very controversial. Not controversial. Um, controversial in that we're attempting to show something to the customer, and not just show the garment. And um, what we're attempting to show is that we make clothes for for moments that the woman can remember. And the woman, you know, very important parts of, of someone's moments, you could wear a Leslie Faye, and uh, it's not just putting that Leslie Faye dress out there. Um, your campaign was the one which was, if you do not spend all your days going... Um, just going. Uh, yeah. that, was a, that was a very exciting, I think. Well, we keep improving upon it, we hope, and um, I can't tell you that it's... that everybody is calling in and telling us, uh, where they, give me the eight dresses on the... On the page, but we get tremendous response to the advertising, uh, sometimes more than uh, more, it all depends what the occasion is, but um, we're creating occasions, we're spending a lot of money doing it because it's uh, eight to ten people in the year. Uh, obviously the production costs are, are um, important, and we're, we're really not trying to sell one dress. We did an ad the other day on a um, petite dress, we just showed the girl. And you know, we had uh, almost a thousand responses to it. That's one kind of advertisement. This yeah. is another kind of advertisement. Now, does this work? Leslie Fay Division is pulling away from their competitors. I don't know if it's worked because of the advertising, but I think the advertising helped us to create the product. And we've changed. Obviously, Leslie Fay is not what Leslie Fay used to be. So, uh, hopefully, it works. My father hates it. Hates it. What, you mean yeah. he believes in item advertising yeah. all the time? Yeah. I, well, um, that's an interesting development, evolution of a whole philosophy of uh, how business should be done. Right? Um, but it is, uh, well, 
it's an approach which I think people are going to remember. I mean, I remember it. I remember that series very well. Uh, now that you've come to mention it, sure. The first one was in the church for a wedding. Mm -hmm. We're not afraid to try something. Uh, and when I tell you one thing about this company, we're not afraid to admit it didn't work. And I think if Leslie Fay has a strength, which we it obviously does, I think it's the ability to uh, maybe not be the first in a certain spot, but to diversify into the areas, to be aware of what's happening in the marketplace and to be able to diversify into those areas that become uh, important and to get in and out of the areas that are not important. Uh, how much time, if you set up a new division, about how much time do you think you give it to see if it'll work? Well, uh, I don't think we've ever closed a new division. We've closed a division that hasn't done well, but. Uh, I'd say within a year it should be profitable. If it's not profitable, it, the only reason it's not profitable is the man running it might not be the right man, the designing might not be right, which, but the designing's got to do with the man running it. And, uh, or it might be the wrong product, but I tell you right now, we haven't gone into any wrong products. We might have gone into the areas wrong. I know we have to make some adjustments. But well, for example, John Palmer, you closed that after how long? We closed it. Uh, we closed it after five years and after the best year it ever had. I see. Uh, what happened was a major, it was a major um, change in the industry. And that's that leisure suit kind mm -hmm. of a thing which uh, stores thought would go forever. And uh, it stopped, all of a sudden it stopped. And, and you had not geared to a change? We tried to change, but the stores were, were doing so well with what they were buying from us that they, they, they just wanted to put their money into uh, See, the problem with business today is this classification of retailing and buying is so important because they don't have the merchants that we used to have in the old one I broke in. So if the classification stays good, you don't, you want to spend all your money in that classification. And even though we made it, they wouldn't buy it from us. My father calls it the Chiffon story. He, he might or might not have told you that. But we don't believe it really we don't believe in being in one item for any one of our companies because while the item might be great, uh, eventually everything, the only thing constant in our business is that there's change. And uh, so, so you can make a lot of money sometimes. I mean, uh, some of these designer gene companies made a fortune, but maybe now they're giving it back. I like that as a motto. You said, the only thing constant in our industry is change. It changes all the time. It goes from subtle changes to dramatic changes. Uh, it goes from coordinates to separates, back to coordinates, from petites to regulars, back. Uh, you know, and you have to be on it. You've got to have the right people to know when to jump in and when to pull out. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it. The other thing is that today the, um, the important part of our industry, the growth part of our industry, seems to be in the active wear. That's why we want to be in the active wear and that's why we bought uh, head. And, you know, we're going to obviously put head into a lot of areas that gear to active and weekend clothing that they're not in today. And then hopefully we'll go into Europe and um, maybe this will be the chance for us to get into Europe, which is a whole other story. This will be a follow-up interview with John Pomerantz on February Wednesday, March 3rd, 1982. The interviewer is Mildred Finger. Should we talk a little bit about what that whole other story is about Europe? What, what do you mean? Well, uh, I think that if we are a typical American uh, manufacturer, and I, even though I think we're a good one, we probably are typical, we don't really know the European market. And somehow you have to get a foothold into that market. And what I was saying is that maybe having a German company would be my way of getting a foothold into finding out more about the marketing 
strategies in Europe because they are different. Different tariffs in each country, um, different kind of stores, different kind of advertising, different kind of everything. And traditionally, we haven't had the patience to to go after that export of Europe and suffer through the trials and the and the time losses and everything to get started when we have this great market here in America. That's really what I was trying to say. Mm-hmm. So you think that um, that Hedsky itself or the people in it might be able to give you some direction about how to go about selling. Uh, how to go about marketing, I guess. Marketing. Yeah. And, and yeah. How, like, how go, I, don't, I don't know if that's so, but I, I think we're going to look into it and see. In other words, you are one of the, one of the American firms interested in export. I'd love to export. I just don't have the patience to export when I could build up all the business we have here in America. See, America is such a phenomenal market. And as we go into new products, we we open up America again for each product we go into. So we probably get a little lazy against some of our worldwide competition who don't have that huge market, so they have to come to America to sell. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Were you part of that experiment last year? No. You no, were not? No. I've, we've done a lot of experimenting. We haven't found that. We, we feel that to do it, there'd be a tremendous capital outlay in it probably a lot of loss. We'd probably lose a lot of money in the first couple of years, and there's no guarantee. So as the president of the company, I just felt to put the capital, it's better to do it where I know I could do well. I know my market, and as long as my market isn't saturated for my products, I'd rather try to to keep doing it the way I'm doing it. But I know the future of this, kind of this industry is a worldwide industry. I just don't know when the future is going to start. Um, and it's your philosophy usually, not necessarily to be the first, but to be uh, try to right behind better. the first, right, maybe. Right. We'd like to try to, um, when we do it, we want to do it right. Sometimes if you do it first, you don't do it right. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, ha- you just mentioned you're buying a new company. Well, we're in the midst of buying a something we haven't been, we really haven't done. We're, we've been following the very meteoric career of a young lady named Catherine Conover who, who just started in business and who's been selling to Lord and Taylor primarily. And I think this week we'll probably take over her company. So this is an illustration of the kind of thing that does happen or can happen? In this industry, sure. Now that opens up a whole new product and I can sell every store. What is her product, for example, that you don't have? It's a price line of dresses above Leslie Fay, uh, but below Casper. It's very young and contemporary, and it sells for about $150 in the stores. And I think she's a great talent. Well, that you know kind of leads me into what was essentially going to be the, the last subject that I wanted to discuss anyway. Namely, how do you feel, or what do you feel is the role of new young people coming in are they best when they come out of school, if they've got a school, are they best off getting a job? Can they? How do you go into business? What's your whole feeling about that? Well, it's still one of the only industries in America where you can realize the American dream. Uh, and that is to start a little business with no money and if you've got the talent and you work hard and you click with each other, you can become successful. Um, I think there's a dearth of talent in my part of the industry and we consistently, we're constantly searching for people. Some people come into a big company like ours and they think they're going to get locked in and put in a little space and they won't get recognized. But uh, we're constantly trying to promote young people and yet young people are constantly trying to go into their own business too. This is a very interesting industry in that it can be done still. It's one of the few industries where it still can be done. You could click. Uh, How much money do you think you need if, if you're a young, let's say you're a young person who's just come out of FIT or Parsons or one of those? Well, what are the they, if, if, uh, well this, this young girl, Catherine Conover, probably started with 50000 or $100,000. I know they've put more money in since, and um, I imagine we'll all start to recoup some of the profits, but it means a very limited amount of money because obviously young people don't have the money but it means designing, selling, carrying the clothes on your back, 
watching it being made in the, in the shop. And that's really the fun part of the industry today. And it's the only industry I think that could still have that. Uh, I read an article about the computer, about what's happening in California with these young people who are going to computer business. It seems to me like the same kind of a thing. But they, th this is an industry that's really crying out for young people. You think that there is really room still? There is room. Oh, this this is definitely it's, it's the next ten years in this industry could be mind-boggling because we don't even know who our com customer could be ten years from now. Could be the department stores. It could be that we'll be selling television, uh, cable, new cable networks. Uh, uh, could be that there won't be a traditional department store. It looks to me like the traditional small specialty store is having a lot of troubles right now, and I don't know what, you know, in the next few years what will happen with them. So it's a constant industry of change. And you're saying that at the moment we're, we're really uh, at the beginning of period of which of, of, of real transition I mean that's what it, you, it sounds as though you're saying I'm saying that the electronic industry has is going to change our industry probably and it, it, whether it happens in the next 10 years well I'll be here of uh, my predecessor someone's got to look into it. my successor <laughs> I mean, yeah. right. um, someone's got to look into that because I think that's going to be the way of the future Every day we hear horror stories about traditional O-line department stores having financial problems. The Bloomingdale's and the Saks Fifth Avenue's and the Lord and Taylor's keep, and the Macy's, they keep doing well, but some of the second and third line stores in the cities are having, are having great difficulty. So you think that's going to be a major, I and that there so, is a yeah. major? Hopefully it won't happen for a while, but I think it's something we all have to look into which would open up a whole new industry for us because we'd have to be selling all new type of customers. So you think the distribution methods are going to be I think so. dramatically different? Yeah. And I hope I'll be equipped to do it. You know, I, I don't think that my father, who was phenomenal, could have done the things we're doing now, but I know I couldn't have done what he did. Yeah, right. But so well, now what kind I of things are you doing now? What do you mean? Well, we're, we're, a, we're big and the flow of information to our people is enormous. And you've got to have the patience to read that information. You've got to have the patience to understand it, and you've got to have the patience to to marry that with the with what we want you to be, which is an entrepreneur. And the ones that can do that are successful. The ones that think in the past can't do it. Mm -hmm. So we're in the, we've changed so in the last 10 years, but then I think we'll change again in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. It's, it's going to be an industry of change. But yet, Leslie Fay has been in business for, Leslie Fay by itself, under the Leslie Fay name, has been in business for about 42 years, and my father was in business 20, 25 years before that, 20 years before that. Well, but I think in, in, in other parts of our uh, uh, interviews, you have said that this is an, and you said, you said something which I liked so much, namely that there is, um, a, it, there, this is an industry in which n nothing is sure except that it's going to change. That's right. So it's something like that. Yeah. And so now you're saying we're, th we're really starting in an el electronic age and that the industry is going to be involved with that. That's right. And there'll be home computers and they'll be plugged into department stores and they'll probably be seeing telephones and you'll be able to see who you speak to on the phone and you'll probably be able to see merchandise right from your home. and. and uh, you know, the, the next few years could be mind-boggling. Do you ever see this as being a direct sale to the consumer? Is that in your thinking? I've thought about maybe starting our own catalog for all our products, but that's still in the thinking stage. But I imagine we're going to get into something like that eventually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that would make sense. Right, yeah. Um, well, as you have said, the one thing that is true all the time is that it changes constantly. So. Anything is open to you at this point. Right. Yeah, right.